Hello, and welcome to a field episode of the Latest Shiny Podcast. This is Rob Hirschfeld. I'm live at Interop ITX 2018. I'm here with Scott Lowe, field engineer at um, Heptio. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Um, previously with VMware and a pretty well-known blogger in, yeah. the, in the VMware space, deserting the community there. <laughs> Uh, in favor of you know the, the welcoming arms of the container infrastructure, the, the new shiny, the new shiny, the latest shiny, the latest shiny. <laughs> exactly. Give us a little bit of background on what's going on and, and how things are going. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, it was a it was a very big decision. Um, I mean, it's a it's a big technical change, and for somebody who's been in the VMware space for you know, probably 15 years now, right, writing books and blogging about it and speaking at the conference and all that, a little scary. But at the same time, you know, I've been talking with folks for the last couple of years about how their skill sets need to change and how they need to evolve and and how they need to push themselves sort of outside their comfort zone. And much in the same way that, you know, you kind of saw me through my through my blogging as we begin to embrace like all these other technologies and these other things, I felt like it was important to kind of take that step now and pursue that in my own career, right? And so, you know, it, it had been phenomenally successful. I thoroughly enjoyed my time within the VMware space and thankful for all the folks that I met and, and all that. And I'm not, you know, like not burning, not bridges. deserting the yeah. deserting the community, so to speak, right? <laughs> but but at the same time, it was time to to kind of put myself out there and say, okay, let's let's go look at you know what what is the next evolution of my career, the next evolution of my skill set. Where do I believe I can make a difference? Um, where can I try to take some of the lessons and the principles that I've applied in terms of interacting with others within the VMware community? Where can I replicate that for the benefit of others in other communities, right? And so looking at that, I felt like that Kubernetes containers were really making uh, a very significant impact. There's lots of dynamic change there. It's a new technology. And if nothing else, I found that I've been reasonably effective at taking new technologies and helping other people consume them. And so this seemed like a very good fit. Well, but if, if I look at it from that perspective, you've been doing virtualization for a long time. And in that case, there's a transition to learning the tech mm-hmm. and how it impacts and changes their lives. You feel like it's, you're at the same place at the beginning of that journey with containers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there something that you think like people coming into the container community need to understand? In many ways, this is as much you know a journey for me beginning in, in the space. I mean, I've been you know working with containers and working with Kubernetes, but there, now that this is like my primary thing, right? Um, there's a whole another level of sort of expertise and understanding and knowledge that I have to cultivate. And so, in some ways, you know, I'm I'm still figuring out exactly what that path is going to look like for me and how I'm going to build that expertise. I'm sure some of that will end up being reflected in various ways through the content that I generate and that I share back with the community. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I, w- I would say that the most important thing, if you are coming new into it, maybe if you're coming from the VMware space, mm-hmm. I think the important thing to understand is that like, this isn't, isn't necessarily a replacement for virtual machines. It may end up replacing virtual machines for various things that you're doing. Yeah. But I think a lot of people at the time, you know, as so often in technology, we end up creating this false dichotomy of, it's this or that, and in reality, it's going to be you know, a lot of different things yeah. for a lot of different time, which is why people still have non-virtualized bare metal workloads in their data centers. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, I guess part of what I see, and I'm interested in your take on it, right? VMware is an infrastructure story. Um, VMs are an infrastructure story. Containers and Kubernetes are not an infrastructure story. It, is that is that, how do you how do you explain that to people? That's part of that jump, right? Well, the, yeah, it, it is part of the jump. I mean, it's part of, you know, I just literally just finished a session, you know, speaking the same time you were here at Interop and talking about how people who are focusing on infrastructure need to move up the stack. And people who are looking at applications need to move down the stack because we need to understand how these things impact and affect one another, right? Sure. An application is affected by the infrastructure and an application affects the infrastructure and vice versa. And so for me, I'm hoping that my experience in the infrastructure space and looking at hypervisors and storage and networking and virtual machines and all that stuff. Oh, that the I've infrastructures. Done, yeah, yeah. All the stuff that I've done you know, for the last 15 plus years, now being able to leverage that and, and use that to enhance my understanding of how we deploy applications on top of them and how that infrastructure being deployed and consumed by applications affects how we deploy them and, and how we provision that and how we manage it and all of that stuff. It's, it's a, and it's a really different story, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. To me, so so you chose to work for Heptio. I did. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in some of that story. I'm interested in, in how Heptio is approaching that conversation. From your, I know you're still new and shiny uh, <laughs> with Heptio, but you know why why Heptio and, and how does how do, how are they talking about this transition in a way that appeals to you? Right, right. So as I began looking for opportunities.
opportunities um, after being a lawyer. I had a couple goals in mind, like from a, just from a career perspective, right? One, mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to go to work with Stark. Okay. This is the first time I've done that. You're I'm, crazy. I, okay. I may be crazy, I and I may, you know, afterwards decide I'm never ever going to do this again. But I had to at least get it out of my system. I, I hope they find a great exit. <laughs> I <laughs> hope they do too. It's always it's, uh, it's like the cheer, that's the toast for yeah, uh, exactly startups. You, you find a great exit. Yeah. <laughs> so there was there was that. I also wanted a role where I was far more um, involved in technology. You know, my role over the last few years as I transitioned between companies and you know, responsibilities and products had grown to be very very high level. And that's fun in some aspects, but from from evaluating like what I found enjoyable about the job, it was when I was really deeply embedded in the technology, right? And that's where I felt like I could be most effective in taking the technology and understanding it and relating it to others. So instead of looking for something like a field CTO or even a you know full out CTO, I had the opportunity to be a CTO for a very, very early stage startup. Okay. Right. And and that would have been a you know fascinating opportunity, right? But in looking at what my goals and my objectives were for the job change, it didn't fit where I was trying to go. Right. And so when I looked at the opportunities and I had several of them, sort of where they were, and, you know, each of the companies that were involved and all of that, um, what, what attracted me most, I feel, was a couple of things. One, their, their approach to, to Kubernetes specifically, right? And then more broadly, the open source projects, which is something that I've been involved in, you know, fairly significantly over my time here. Right? Um, to the team, you know, joining a company is as much about the, the people as it is about the technology. Mm-hmm. So when I thought about who out there is building a world class team around Kubernetes, they always came coming back. Right? Okay. And it's not to say that there aren't world class people elsewhere, right? But the, the the quality of the people that they were attracting was in, in itself attractive. Um, and then, uh, you know, third, to be honest with you, and I, I don't know why this is the case, right? But when I began thinking about Kubernetes companies, um, Heptio was the brand that came to mind. I don't know why that is. And, Somewhere probably in Seattle, one of the marketing folks is saying, "Yes, I was successful, <laughs> right?" Um, but but that's just kind of where it is. I mean, you know, we had Craig Buckley and Joe Beta as, as founders, both coming out of Google, helping launch Kubernetes when they're at Google. And so maybe there's that part of it. I don't know. But I'm um, looking at that, and it felt like this was the right opportunity. It was it was a, a mindset and a way of approaching Kubernetes and open source that, that felt very compatible and very natural to me. It was um, a way that I think is beneficial both from the commercial aspects, like building a sustainable business, but also being beneficial to the open source part, which is where we can kind of all contribute back to society and community as a whole, right? You know, just sort of hearing Craig and Joe talk about their vision for the company and the culture they wanted to build and being very sustainable about it, right? And being saying, we want to, we want to build a company where everybody can grow and flourish. Right? We can build something that, you know, yes, we, you know, we may all get fabulously rich, but we're not going to like kill ourselves trying to get there. We want to build a sustainable business, right? And that was appealing to me as opposed to some of the much younger founders that I had spoken with. And they're like, you know, no, 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 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, you know, whatever it takes. And to be perfectly fair, the fact that I didn't have to leave Denver was a plus to me. Yeah. <laughs> Distributed teams are important. Yeah, absolutely. What, what people are building. And I, I'm not, you know, building startup is not a you know short journey. And so you, know, you need a sustainable work habit right for it, um, you know, Definitely, there, there's it's work, but oh yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can't sprint the whole time, right, right, right. It's a marathon. You have to think about it. <laughs> uh, and frankly, this is you know, Rob's aside in this is that <laughs> if you're working 80 hours every week, there's no slack time. You're gonna never be able to handle the, the things that come up that you actually have to really deal with. And so yeah. you're, you're constantly right. making compromises. Um, and I don't find people who are constantly making compromises build their product. Agreed. So, and Hefty has taken a really sort of an unusual approach from my perspective in, in this, right? Because Kubernetes is a big open source project. Um, it's clearly becoming sort of a de facto leader in the container orchestration space, but it's far from complete. Correct. Um, I, would, I would really just call it a kernel of the container world, not, it's, you know, not even a, there's all sorts of gaps and holes and things like that. And Hefty feels like they've thrown themselves in front of the breach and, and sort of trying to plug all the holes in the dam. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of the way it, it feels, right? You uh-huh. know, oh, we have a new project that solves this problem, a new project yeah. that solves that problem. Yeah, yeah. Is that the strategy? I mean, how does that, is that what they're doing? Is that how it works? Well, some of it plays into our longer term strategy, which involves things that we haven't uh, announced or, or unveiled yet. Okay. So I have to know there's I, a longer I, strategy. I, I, we don't there's a bigger picture there that it. I can't disclose at this time, right? But the, the key thing is that I would that I would say is that we approach everything with a, a decidedly open source mind. Okay. And, and let me give you an example, right? So we have these open source projects that we launched, like Arc, 
for letting you back up if you use uh, some cool cluster that you care should cluster this thing. Contour for using Envoy as a load balancer. Case on it is a templating language. Um, and what about Sonoboard okay. for you know, testing performance, right? Mm-hmm. Making sure that a cluster that is running Kubernetes behaves and expects and reacts the way that this cluster should, right? Mm-hmm. And so you look at all these things, and all of these things came out of our experience with customers saying, look, we're, we're trained to do Kubernetes, and we don't have a way of doing blah, right? And we're like, okay. You know, and so to that point, it kind of looks like, well, well, you know, let's stick our finger in the dam right there because, you know, that's a... That's a you're in a lot of ways, right. that's what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we're, we're trying to be right customer-focused and helping address customers' pain points, right? Okay. But the other part of it is that we want to do that. We want to do that in a gentle community. We don't want it to be us as a company saying we're going to plug all the gas. Instead, us mm-hmm. as part of a broader community helping to plug gas, right? Okay. So um, after launching some of these open source projects, for example, we shut down our internal Slack channels for these projects okay. and, and instead rely completely on the Kubernetes community Slack channels because we didn't want any sort of internal, you know, back channel communication about Sonoboy or, or Contour or Arc or Gimbal or any of the others, right? We want them to all be developed in the open, in conjunction with the community, and driven alongside the Kubernetes. Which which makes a lot of sense. There's there's some small angst I have thinking through like OpenStack Big Ten type <laughs> of concepts where you're sort of like you know, you're you're throwing projects in and they become community projects. Right, I don't feel like Kubernetes is turning around and, and trying to expand its mission for these projects. These projects are solving problems. They become part of a general, you know, if they're useful, right. they're useful. If they're not, you know, it's, it's fine. There's, right. other, there's other alternatives. So, yeah, I can I can see that. But open source is a funny thing because, right, you, you've got to figure out a way to sustain the engineering around Absolutely. what these projects are. Absolutely. Um, and if a customer's depending on Sonoboy as a thing, uh-huh. How do you build a commercial right. support model for that? Right. Part part of our strategy is uh, launch open source projects or create open source projects when we mm-hmm. feel like there's something valuable that we can help address within the community. Right. Okay. So again, around Sonoboy, Contour, or, or or Case on it. Although Case on it, you know, we're being frank, like we kind of know this. It hasn't quite gotten the traction in the community. It hasn't quite solved the problems we needed. So we need to reevaluate and see, mm-hmm. you know, what are we doing wrong? And can we do something better there? Right. But and that and that's part of the whole. Well, part of the yeah. nice thing about open source is that you can you can and I'll say this a little tongue in cheek, but you can abandon something that somebody finds useful and say, "Well, it's, you know, if you like it, you keep maintaining it. Right. We're moving on to something new." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, um, right. There's that aspect of it, right? We do have a sort of a broader strategy which we feel will kind of knit all of these things together. But from from a commercial perspective, you know, right now we have our our, our product is this FDO Kubernetes subscription HKS, right, okay. which involves um, offering customers proactive and reactive support for their Kubernetes cluster. And, which is um, hard, which is actually hard to find in community, right? There isn't a lot of people right. who say, "I will be on yeah. the phone, fix a bug for you." In exactly. Kubernetes. And and that's you know kind of where we're going is like you know kind of holding ourselves to the to the fire, so to speak. And that is like we're we're telling customers as part of HKS, yeah. look, if we need to patch a bug for you, you know, we'll carry those patch binaries until that patch gets merged upstream, right? Okay. And and you know and that's, that's a big thing. It is important. It's important to customers to know that they have somebody they can fall back on. And so. That's been successful, and we have lots of customers who are signing up for HKS. Okay. The, the, I guess the key distribu- the key thing about HKS is that it's not a distribution. It's not a packaging of Kubernetes. It is upstream Kubernetes, right? Okay. Um, and we're very emphatic about this. Like, we, don't, we don't believe that you know, sort of forking the project, if you will, to create a distribution, which is essentially what you do when you create a distribution, right? Effectively. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. effectively, right. Yeah. Is that we don't think that's the right way of doing it. We think it runs the risk of causing fragmentation in the community. It runs the risk of there being sort of problems that might hinder the community in the longer haul, right? But we'd rather help customers be successful with upstream Kubernetes <laughs> and focus our efforts on upstream Kubernetes. As long as, you're, as, long as you're, your patch comes back. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, and that's where it comes on us, right? right. It's this like, is, you, you know, know. Call it, calling out um, Red Hat a little bit with OpenShift, right? OpenShift had advanced features that were forked, and then they had to fight to get those features back in mm-hmm. and or, you know, Basically, pull users back from features that didn't make it into mm-hmm. community or implemented the way they'd done it. Right. And so, yeah, that customers want to run fast, and you have to have the discipline to say, but we don't. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll patch you. It's actually about yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's where the focus is. It's less about delivering a feature that isn't being delivered by the community, and more about fixing an actual bug. And then, and then, you know, us leveraging you know, our involvement in the community because we have developers who are actively contributing to Kubernetes on a variety of fronts, and not just our open source projects, but the Kubernetes core efforts themselves, and, and saying, okay, now we're going to try and take this, this patch back upstream and fix it for everyone, right, but we'll carry it for this particular customer as long as they need to be, right? And that 
tricky because what you're really mm-hmm. talking about is undifferentiated Kubernetes. Correct. Right. So, so the differentiation has to be carried somewhere else. Correct. Either from extensions that you've been building, pot, you know, products that make it easier to use Kubernetes. Correct. Um, you know, or the support, or you might decide, and I think this is reasonable. Kubernetes doesn't need differentiation; mm-hmm. it just needs to be a good, solid base that that you know can work cross platform. Right. Again, this goes back to sort of a bigger strategy that we have, but but largely our view is that you know we want Kubernetes, undifferentiated Kubernetes, to be the solution that we can use. Place our efforts there in really driving the community and driving the solution that we're. The, the problems that we're hearing from customers, right? So we're really, really focused on as we interact with customers um, on a regular basis, you know, doing implementation for them or doing design architecture reviews for them or whatever the case may be, solving problems, et cetera, et cetera, feeding that information back, feedback loop to the community, right? So that the community hears what customers are saying as they're trying to do it and therefore can react in a way that is you know, applicable. I, I guess in part what I see that I like about the Kubernetes community is the differentiation points or the extension points are being identified and carved out of the project, mm-hmm. not injected into the project. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I, I, I believe the community as a whole wants an undifferentiated Kubernetes as a base. Mm-hmm. And then they want to be able to plug in components where it's you know, where there are differences, whether mm-hmm. it's Amazon, Google, Microsoft, or right. premises infrastructure. Right. right? Those become pluggable components, mm-hmm. and then you're not arguing, right? You don't have a tragedy resistance problem. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and I agree with you. I mean, if you look at the architecture of Kubernetes, it became sort of, you know, container runtime interface, container storage interface, container networking interface. They, they give you these ways where somebody can differentiate in a particular area. Um, the cloud provider is another example, right? You know, they can differentiate in some area, but the core of Kubernetes remains undifferentiated and provides the value that you're looking at across a variety of different platforms. Do you think that means Kubernetes uh, sort of Evens out at some point that, that we, we I don't think we're going to ever finish any of these projects, <laughs> right? You don't want to, but it might slow down a little bit or stabilize to a point where it's like, hey, we've re- we've we've reached, you know, Kubernetes, you know, one zero <laughs> done, yeah. right? And we're, and we're incremental progress at that point. I'd say that at some point. I don't know when. Uh, I I I would need to spend more time in the, in the community really getting into the code, which I plan on doing area where I'm going to grow is trying to increase my coding skills, right? But um, I would say, you know, it, it seems very likely that it will occur. I just don't know how far out that will happen, right? And, you know, I mean, I think we've seen that to a certain extent with some areas of Kubernetes, you know, as the API progresses, and you look at, you know, versioning the API, right? So this part is only being unstable, this part is being in beta, this part is being alpha, that kind of stuff, right? You see certain areas of Kubernetes, certain specifications and definitions are beginning to be like, okay, these are stable, these are defined, and these you know, they don't really need to change as much, and then there are other areas where that changes very much more rapidly. Um, and so, you know, as a whole, though, I think the project will continue to evolve, but I think it's certainly very reasonable to say that certain areas will begin to become very, very stable, and, and you know, will, I guess for lack of a better term, go into maintenance mode, right, where we're just fixing critical things, and, and we don't really see drastic evolution in those areas. Makes sense. And I think that would be a good thing. And I, I look at some core technologies that are essential, uh, Istio, specifically the service mesh more generally, mm-hmm. right? You really need a service mesh to run a um, you know, microservices application. It's still hard, mm-hmm. right? And, and I, I can see you know, that's not Kubernetes. It's just a thing that's always distributed with Kubernetes. Right. It's sort of like Ceph and OpenStack was. Yeah. It's like, all right, yeah, if, you know, they, they became you know, peanut butter and jelly. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's I think that it's fine to see certain projects always companion, mm-hmm. um, but they're still distinct projects. So it's not the only way to do it. Right. right. That's, that's a good model, and that, that's a good place where there's growth and there's change. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. So we had talked a little bit in prep about open source models, yeah. uh, community models. You want to dive a little deeper in that? Is that um, how do we you know how do we monetize open source in general? Yeah. Well, and you know, and I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier talking about FGO kind of went through me there and that, you know, I'd, I'd become much more involved in open source over the last few years, you know, involving OpenStack, which is when I first met, and then, you know, work contributing to projects like Open Research and then VMware and others, right? And, um, you know, there's this, a lot of times there's this inherent sort of something unreconciled between when you are working at a commercial proprietary software vendor 
and that bidder is trying to be involved in the process. And even you know when they are doing the right thing, when they buy a project and supporting it and keeping it open and keeping everybody you know on an equal contribution basis, meaning you want where they're not when they are truly playing fair and, and giving back to the community. You know, even then, still there's this this sort of unresolved tension. And, and I think a lot of it comes to you know kind of what we talked about earlier, and that is that sometimes people lose sight of the fact that the relationship between you know commercializing and monetizing open source and open source itself that relationship needs to be symbiotic. It needs to be mutually beneficial, right? Um, in that open source by itself, um, as you know, as in the, everything must be free as in speech and free as in beer, you know, um, that by itself. Which are very different things. They yeah. are very different very things. Different that's free. correct. Yes. Um, that by itself isn't enough because somebody's got to, you know, pay the bills on the infrastructure that runs these things and the developers that write the code and, and that kind of stuff, right? I mean, right. the vast majority of these developers are not independently wealthy and, you know, don't need to be paid. They, they need, they have bills and they have families. And, and for this, and for infrastructure software, this is real stuff, right? Yeah. It gets in production. So how do you sustain, you know, for the sustaining engineering that, mm-hmm. that we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Your, your answer to, I have a bug in Kubernetes, can't be patched to the new version, right? Sometimes it has to be, I'm going to help you figure out what you're doing, spend some time, be the other, you know, this is, this is where Heptio is, right? Be on the phone saying, all right, yep. we're not, the answer is not upgrade and patch, right? Or figure it out yourself by reading the code. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a commercial, that's a transaction, right? Somebody... I, I, I talked to somebody about it as babysitting, sort of, right? It's <laughs> right. it's right, you know, or, or therapy, right? Yeah. You're you know, somebody you need you call up somebody so they can listen to your problems and offer you advice. Yeah, that's exactly um, right. Yeah, and that's you you, yeah. you don't get that for free. No, no, I mean, and, and that's and that's the reality. I mean, like it, it is what it is, right? I mean, you know, when you want to have that that person or group or company that you can call up and say, I ran into this problem and I don't know how to get around it, and it's, it's impacting my business's ability to do what a business needs to do, right? There's there's something in that, and there's value in that, and that's why part of you know, the HKS is us doing this, providing support, giving you people you can call, providing SLAs, and that sort of thing around you know somebody they can call, and that's fine. That's part of it, right? The other part of it, I think, is is building a model whereby you can you can be uh, an open, decidedly open source company, right? right? And maybe support is an aspect of how you sustain engineering to provide that, right? Um, maybe it's other products that you're going to sell that are, are not open source. You know, maybe it's uh, SaaS services that you're going to offer. That seems to be a really common model. You yeah, know, like it's a very um, common model. Sysdig, for example, you know they have the open source piece, right? But then if you really want to get some other stuff, you've got to tie it into SaaS, SaaS software, right? And that seems to be a really common model. I've heard Martin Casado talk about that model being a, a very common model that he sees emerging. You know, that's what forward. I mean. It's what Racken's doing. From right, there's open source pieces with Vision Rebar, and then mm-hmm. Racken will, will take enterprise extensions and make the product more usable. Right. right. I think that it's you know with Kubernetes, since it's not FDO's product or project, even mm-hmm. it's it's easier to say, yeah, we'll help you, but that's you know, that it's it's not, not our stuff. You're going to have to pay us. So big open source communities are like that. Although it didn't work out that way from an OpenStack perspective. <laughs> no, it did not. Um, but that might be a topic for a different podcast. That's a topic for another <laughs> podcast. It's well trodden ground too. Um, but I, you know, I do think the, the the consumers here need to have this. To me, is one of the sea changes that I haven't seen yet in the market. Right? Is if you're using open source software, you need to be thinking in the back of your mind. I better pay, especially if you're an enterprise running something in production. I need to find some support process where I'm paying engineers who are sustaining this project. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the reality is, you know, we talk about open source software being free, and we made the distinction earlier about, you know, free as in speech, right, and free as in beer. But the reality is, like, it's never going to be truly free as in beer. Like, you may not have to pay a license for it, and you may even choose not to pay somebody to support it, but you will pay either in an outage or in downtime or in building that expertise on your own team. Right. And, and, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's fine, but it's about, the, you know, the, the, to, to your point, it's about helping consumers understand that there is going to be a cost. Well, and there's a different side effect. Um, because what, what can happen is if you pay the, the tax of having somebody on your team understand the tech, they're going to go implement it in their way. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and if they do that, 
there's no economy of scale because their way is, is almost certainly not the next person's way. Right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's the galaxy with a thousand, uh, yeah, a thousand versions of a single role. Of a single yeah. role. Yeah, yeah. And so, right, that's not a good open source model. Right. right? I agree. Because now we have a whole bunch of people repeating effort. There's no economies of scale. So mm-hmm. vendor, you know, our job, right, Heptio, Racken, every, you know, everybody else, is to say this is a pattern that I want to see promoted. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, open source code is great. People can see it. They can use it. They can have an opinion. They can check the quality, mm-hmm. make sure everything. You know, all those are awesome, right? We love when somebody yep. finds a bug and says, "Hey, I think this line is wrong," right. and we are happy when they tell us we fix it instead of them doing a pull request. There's yeah. no shame in that, right? Um, but yet, we we at the you know, same time from an open source perspective don't want you to do six different six different ways, right? 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 And I think that's that's actually part of part of why we're involved in the conformance effort within Kubernetes, mm-hmm. right? Part of why we created and launched Sonoboy, which is the project that the Kubernetes community has converged upon to test conformance, and that is to help customers understand, you know, yeah, there may be minor differences in how you go about implementing it, right? But in the end, we want to make sure that what you implement behaves and expects and reacts in a certain way, right? Um, uh, as defined by the Kubernetes community, right? So, so this this is been my favorite question of the of the month. Okay. So, right, if if we have a conformance in Kubernetes, does it create a marketplace for people to write software that works against the conformant Kubernetes cluster that I can now sell you as a licensed software package? Not SaaS. Yeah. But but you know, Foo Company writes bar product spec that solves some problem for you that you right. want to run. Okay, gotcha. And you, they say as long as you have a conformant Kubernetes you can buy our software and run it. Is it is there, are we able to create a market like that? Well, I mean, it might be a bit early for me to, to definitive answer that, but okay. my, my initial guess would be yes. Okay. In that, you know, um, recognizing conformance doesn't necessarily dictate stability of APIs over time. Sure. Right? But it seems to me, at least, where I am right now on this journey, that if we did have a conformant cluster, right, um, that it should behave in a specific way. And that's the whole purpose of, of tools like Sonoboy is to test it, look at the test results and say, this is how it behaved and therefore it passed the test or did not, right? right. And then based on that that knowledge, then be able to say, um, yes, a, an application written to this version of the conformance tests should run in a, in a consistent way on any cluster that passes these tests, right? Now, again, keep in mind, performance doesn't necessarily equal production readiness, right? Performance doesn't check for an HA control plane right. or anything of that nature, right? Um, and those things may make it, may make a, you know, an environment more suitable or less suitable for our running applications. Because I mean, because this is where you know, and you're perfect for this because of your VMware experience. Right? VMware created a market in that people could say, "I don't care what your infrastructure is. If it's mm-hmm. VMware, my stuff will run in it. Here is a VM. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm delivering you a VM. That's correct. And I, I now I don't care about your Hardware. I don't care about your anything. It's like here's VM. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I'm worried that we're we're not going to have independent software vendors because there's no, especially with heterogeneous clouds. There's no, there's no market, right? I, so I, I I hear what you're saying. I totally hear what you're saying. And I think my my initial guess is right that that conformance is the right way of looking at this, right? Because it doesn't really matter in the end. It doesn't really matter if you are running your own Kubernetes cluster or whether you're consuming a managed Kubernetes service from the cloud provider, right? Mm-hmm. If they both behave in the same way and they both respond in the same way to a conformance test and therefore would respond in the same way to an application that you deploy against those APIs, right, right? Then we should get the benefit of being able to say, I can deploy application foo from vendor bar on a conformant Kubernetes cluster, whether that is an on-premises piece that I'm running on vSphere or whether that's Amazon EKS, which is one of the world right. that, that's or That's the Nirvana, that is, right? Yeah. And I, and I think that my initial take is, and Joe and Craig may, may come back and beat me up if I don't get this quite right, but my initial take is where I am, right, is that the conformance is the right way of looking at that. And then right. also giving people a conformance suite that lets them lets that conformance testing be extensive. To say that the test is not just this, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? right. But the test is X, Y, and Z. Plus, we can also have a test A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? right. So some um, depth. Yeah, yeah. exactly. This, and this was our goal with OpenStack DevCore work. This now the, called the interoperability uh, set. 
where you can actually help you know you know people be assured that they they've created conformant block right so yeah. that, that we do create some portability um, and, and it's possible that, that Kubernetes um, is the VMware of the future <laughs> um, in the sense not from a product perspective but from the but being a layer that homogenizes a bunch of different infrastructure right is, yep. a, is an infrastructure abstraction that, mm-hmm. that creates a market yep exactly um, because I really hope that it's not just Amazon Google and Microsoft is the only place their infrastructure gets done yeah that's yeah, not yeah. the world I'm, I'm, <laughs> I want to live in right totally yeah. agree totally agree I'm, my, my belief is and part of the reason why I made the switch to Kubernetes is that it is that. It might be really, really early yet, and we may not be there yet, but my vision, my anticipation is that that's what we're driving towards, is, is having Kubernetes as a you know, infrastructure agnostic way of giving a consistent API for deploying and orchestrating our applications. And, and people forget, I was really early in VMware, you were early in VMware too, right? Just, I go back to 2001, you know, two thousands. It's been twenty years, <laughs> and the first five of those years were, you know, very hard. Yes, right? they were exactly. I, you know, I don't trust this. I don't like it. I don't understand why it's not I ready for production. It. It's not secure. I don't understand it. I don't want to run it. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, so, and we never hear those things anymore about. Yeah. You know, well, we don't hear them about VMware, but but that's the conversation in containers today. So. Yeah, it is. For um, sure. And people have to figure out what the standard patterns and architectures are. Exactly. Um, and that's what people you know, you know, who weren't there at the beginning weren't in that time period where VMware was deployed in 40 different configurations, mm-hmm. right? And we had to wean out um, all the ones that didn't work until we got to the most expensive ones that made the most margin. <laughs> Maybe that's not Maybe the that's pattern. What want. Oh wait, <laughs> that's not the pattern. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I joke because yeah. you know the sand-based VMware is a great thing that unlocks the motion. Yeah, but is a super expensive. Way oh to yeah, figure the it is. It is. Um, uh, yep. <laughs> Scott smiling. He was in VMware while they were doing that. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I, was a, I was a VMware reseller, but you know, it's all the same. <laughs> we were the ones selling them the sands and the, and the hosts. So yeah, it's all good. And so, yeah, and this this is the exciting journey. I, I yep. feel like that that sort of filter is that same filter, right? We're at a point where, as we lock in some of these patterns, mm-hmm. and I feel like Heptio is clearly in that in that mode. And mm-hmm. that's something I appreciate watching the leadership, the quality of the people that, that Heptio has been putting together. It's sort of like let's you know we don't know yet, but. We're, we're turning the knobs until the patterns emerge. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what open source is really good about. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's definitely the case. I mean, we want to we wanna help scale Kubernetes. We want to help customers adopt Kubernetes. And in order to do that, you have to identify the patterns and identify those common configurations and identify the gaps and work with the open source community. And we have to do that in a sustainable way because, you know, the open source community is as important to us as hopefully we are to the open source community and to the customers, right? I mean, it's, it's all about providing value, you know, all the way around. 360 sort of thing, right? That that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to find those patterns. We want to document those patterns. We want to share those patterns, and then help customers be successful. So my virtual Stephen is uh, pinging me that we're we're out of time, uh, <laughs> so we should wrap it up. Yeah. How do people find you? Where where do they go to connect with you and Heptio? Yeah, yeah, sure. So you know Heptio uh, Heptio dot com. Uh, if you want to go look at what's going on at the company, um, there's a blog on Medium as well, but you can link to it off the off the website. I'm not sad. I can't remember Medium URLs. A bit like it'll be, but that's all right. Um, yeah, exactly. exactly. Google is your friend, uh, and then you can follow me on Twitter is at Scott underscore Low, and uh, then um, I share a lot of what I do on my website. It's a uh, blog that's Scott Cool. And you had a podcast too. I, I, I do Please promote. I, I do right. Uh, called the Full Stack Journey Podcast. Um, don't beat me up on the name. It's, it's the name that I found, and I haven't found a better one yet. But if you have a better one, give me an idea. But the idea is. Sort of the changing nature of skill sets that IT professionals need, and not being able to say I'm just a storage person or I'm just a person or whatever the case may be, but needing to move up the stack. Or if you're in infrastructure or down stack, you're in applications. And just kind of being aware of how you know, sort of holistically you know, what 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 you're doing affects the rest of the stacks, and that's available um, as part of the uh, Packet Pushers uh, network. So PacketPushers.net. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rob.